Our guest is in the building. He is Mr. Musa Salmanu, wing commander, retired, but definitely not tired. He's energized and invigorized for our next topic. We'll be talking about fixing insecurity in Nigeria. It's been a hot topic over the past year and extremely hotter even in the past couple of weeks. Insurgency, banditry, terrorism is seemingly still on the rise. Abductions are peppered in our days. Mr. Musa Salmanu, thank you for joining us to talk about this topic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me in your studios. Good morning and welcome. Good morning to you. Good morning, Nigerians, and good morning, viewers. We are expecting the military to come in right from the jump. And instead, it, he said it, pretty much exactly the same thing that you've just said, that it starts from the community, then it goes to police before coming to the military and the, armed, and the rest of the armed forces. So my question to you is, where did we get it wrong? Because from, I don't know if we can say, from the time of dictatorship till now, we have seen and we still see a very heavy presence of even if it's just soldiers, we see a very heavy presence of soldiers on the roads. So is it really out of place for the Nigerian public to feel that since the military is ever so um, present, that it's not their responsibility? Well, so, you know, there is, um, there is what is the ideal, ideal situation. And then there is what is being pragmatic, what is there, what should be done. What do we need to do to get things done? I think what we have done is over the years we have used pragmatism and now turn it to the normal. Now we have seen, we have evolved a society where we think dialogue is weakness. Where as, even as individuals, when I want, when anything, for me to talk with you, I feel, or to have a dialogue over something, that, or some kind of disagreement, I'm seen as that weakly. No, so we need to remove that from our psyche and say that it's, even, it's actually strength to talk because it takes a strong person to bring out what is in their mind to now say that I'm willing to discuss or to talk about that. Now, so if we uh, put that in our own psyche and, and agree with that, then it makes it easy for the society, the entire society, to see that there is nothing wrong for Nigerians, mind you, most of these uh, criminal elements are Nigerians. So we are not a kind of in another country fighting an enemy that is different from us. It's we, we, as we used to say now, we, now we, we, we. Are, you know. So uh, when, we, when we understand that and say that we will adopt the path of dialogue, then the issue of why is the military persistent in our psyche? Because, okay, of course it has its history the uh, military regimes where you saw the military and so on. So even when we went back into civil rule, I think there was that feeling that uh, there's this pent for action, action, action. We want action. Let's, something happens, we, because we are not attuned to dialogue, we say we must bring an end to it. How do we bring an end to it? We say let's use force. So we bring police. When we bring police, the police is not giving us enough force. We say, let's bring the mobile. We bring mobile. That's, the you mobile know, the riot. Police, yeah. Local. They are not giving us enough force. I mean, they are not crushing this. We use that word crush. You know, we crush. So we say, hey, what do we do? Let's bring the military. Bring the firepower. And for God's sake, that is what the military is trying to do, not to dialogue. Okay. Let, let me quickly come in. I think... Um Thus far, we can establish that you're a strong advocate for communication and dialogue. And yes, a lot of um, philosophers will say that that would ultimately be the best way to resolve conflict. But also, where do we draw the line between pampering criminals and um, ensuring that we protect our country against criminals? These are not ex uh, mutually exclusive events. Dialogues go on while you go after criminals, right? I am also a strong advocate for law and order. You can't have a society whereby everybody does anything they do. Then, because that's the essence of government or governance. The essence is to ensure that there is rule of law, that people can go about their legitimate businesses and ensure that nobody is above or below the law in a way that uh, everybody is a respecter of rules and, 
and, and so on. Now, but then there are situations whereby it, those things have been led for so long to go, uh, to get muddled up. Now, it's when you have a complicated or a complex situation, you have to have where you start, what are the inroads. You have to look at opportunities and try to explore that. Now, so the first thing to do is to understand that what are the grievances, if there are any. Now, what, apart from those grievances, how legitimate are those grievances? And sometimes, honestly, we were in our own uh, comfort zone, dismiss the grievances of people. Now, I still go back to individuals. What might be important to me is not necessarily important to you. So sometimes, until you are in my shoe, you will not understand what I am or what I feel about something. Now, if we are able to understand this and try to separate the grievances and criminality, or even the criminality, what led to the criminality, the sort of the root causes, because we're hearing so much now with them talking out and so on and so forth. And you hear that, yes, there are some level of uh, grievances, some legitimate, some, of course, do not do not uh, correspond or do not are not in tandem with their own what uh, so on so what you can do is is like the issue of peace and justice which one comes first so let's say dialogue and 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 law and order or not pampering or so of criminals which one do you do first do you so what I will advocate or what I would ordinary advocate is that use a lot or so much legitimate force to the extent that the people are beginning to feel, or they feel, that you cannot, you cannot take the law into your hands, and so, but then provide a window of opportunity for those that have, that want to change. I would directly ask you this question: Do you support the recommendation of the Sheikh, um, saying that perhaps a blanket amnesty should be given? Now, when you use the word blanket. That is very um, difficult to, to justify because, uh, but there must be some, some form of uh, what they call transitional justice mechanism in both situations. Whereas when you have mass atrocities committed in a large scale by so many people, it is difficult to hold each and every one of them accountable in the normal, formal legal system that we know. I just read a report that 5,000 former uh, suspected Boko Haram um, uh, members are going to go through the legal system. Now, you and me know that trying 5,000 people for crimes that need conviction beyond reasonable doubt and for a system that is, finds it difficult to investigate or to put together exhibits and so on, that there is going to be a tough tax. We have heard in the past where courts or judges have to let go people, not because they don't believe they committed anything, but because the investigations were not co properly conducted. Now you're having 5,000 of these people and, and with crimes that were committed in pervasive environments, I mean in theaters of war and oppression, basically theaters of war, and with little sometimes or no evidence because they're just alleged and so on. Now you're putting these judges in a precarious situation. Now the law says that you cannot convict until you have, you, you can only convict by evidence brought to you by the prosecution beyond reasonable doubt. Now do the prosecution have that? And let's even look at other countries that have had similar situations. When you take example of say uh, Rwanda, thankfully our own is not us. It, it, it's not that. But if you take a situation where there was mass atrocities committed and the rest, people, what people want is justice or, the, or justice to be perceived to be done. Now, these people are tried in a remote area away from the victims. That is one problem. If, and unlike in other crimes and so on, these are crimes that the victims know the perpetrators. These are people that they lost their husbands, their fathers, their daughters, and so on, because they were killed by their neighbor. Someone that they used to play with. Someone that they knew. 
They know when the crime was committed. Now you carry that person out of the community from where that crime was committed. Take them elsewhere, try them, and for one technicality and the other, you say they are not guilty or something. Or even if you convict them, that person, the victim, is not aware of that trial that took place. He doesn't feel that there's a closure. Justice must be must be perceived also. You must feel that justice has been done. But so, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, with all of the suggestions and recommendations that come from dialoguing, Nigerians do not necessarily feel the confidence of justice being planned. In this case, we're yet to even get to a place where justice is served. But it is also the conversations that lead to that situation that are not so encouraging to a lot of people who so much seek this. And I think also we need to start thinking about how this can throw more people to go into crimes. For instance, if we're giving, we're paying ransom now, people are afraid that every other person who is jobless, who feels aggrieved, is now going to take up the arm. Your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, you cannot in any way justify criminality. And like I said earlier on, I believe in law and order. Criminals must be dealt with adequately and justice must be melted out, melt, uh, made out to them um, promptly, promptly. But we have a system whereby uh, a lot, you know, sometimes what we do is to treat things in isolation. You have to treat them in, in, as a whole. Now you, we uh, in the past, if, so I'm focusing on sometimes Boko Haram because that has been long since 2009. We've had 10 years within which to, 10 to 11 years within which to get things right. And so we can use that as a case study to see how most likely, if things don't change, how we're going to handle other uh, elements of criminality. Now, there are the foot soldiers. In everything, you have to uh, kind of separate. You have to separate the masterminds, those that have the highest responsibility in committing those crimes. And they don't have to be physically be there. There could be people that have foiled it to the media. There could be people that have incited others from far away and ensured that. So you go after them. And those ones, it has to be in a way that it is publicized, it is shown that they are tried and brought and jailed if they are found guilty, right? Now there are the foot soldiers that were either brainwashed or something that in honestly, in honesty, in some way, if you look at them, they are even victims honestly, of circumstances and so on. Now, this is, I have to be careful with this because I people could now say, but, hey, how can you say someone in his right mind and whatever are victims? To make the criminal a victim would also be doing injustice to Now, the when I victims. say they are victims, I'm not saying that you should let them go free. What I'm saying is that when you have 5,000 people that you want to try, right, you know our criminal justice system, just by imagination, how long do you think that will take? based on cases that we have seen. How long do you think it would take to try 5,000 people? And this is just perhaps between a certain period. We have not come to the end of this. So perhaps by the end of it, we will have 10,000 people to try. With the justice system that we have today, how long will it take to try them? Now, for as long as you allow these things to linger on, these people, justice has not been served. So we are going back to the same thing as if we are encouraging criminals. Because you get the criminal off the street, you incarcerate that criminal without trying that person for, for as long as it takes. The victim is there feeling that justice has not been served. The criminal or other criminals are saying that, well, it pays to be, crim to be a criminal until when I'm caught and nothing even will be done. So we must find a middle ground. It sounds a How? bit... How? How? Good. The middle ground is to say that um, look at the peculiarity of where these crimes have been committed. For example, and let's still go back to the Northeast. Now, are there traditional systems of justice that are acceptable in those areas? Those are questions we have to start asking ourselves. Now, do we say that the, because the formal system has in a way shown that it takes entirely or eternity it's so expensive, it's so remote from those people that are there. So what is, the, what is the alternative? Look at a system whereby what traditions exist in those localities. Like I told you, these crimes, the victims know the perpetrators. They know them. And so because when you have mass atrocities, 
it would be almost impossible to say you convict all and jail. If you have add 10,000 or 5,000 people to the, let's assume we convict all of them and add 10,000 to the number of prisoners that we already have or those awaiting jail terms in Nigeria, what do we have? So justice is not always punitive. Justice can be ret uh, retributive. Uh, and what is the other form of justice? It, it doesn't have to be that someone has committed something. Some people come back with all they need is to kind of, uh, when they are de-radicalized or desensitized, you find out that they become so sober and they are willing. So people must be provided or avenues must be provided for people to go back to those communities and beg for forgiveness and do some kind of restitution and kind of do community service. We must come up with all these uh, alternatives to say that we must try people, jail them. I will insist that we go after the major perpetrators, the commanders, those that incited others. Those, they should be held accountable. They should be jailed. Based on what you have suggested, again, some of, one of the reasons why, why we have a central constitution is so that we can move forward. The world has evolved. And some of these traditional ways of doing things, um, you know, really hoping not to sound a little too modern, would be considered um, a little too unrefined for the modern world that we now operate in. And so when we suggest this, again, aren't we creating a situation where we might have even more chaos as a result of this? Of course, we've had cases in the last few weeks, in the last few months, where certain people were charged to the Sharia court. And let's just say that we, we had... Um, results that had a lot of tongues wagging. So if you think about that, again, isn't that sort of counterproductive? So you see, uh, yeah, l let me tell you, when I say, um, when we look at the Constitution itself, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to delve into constitutionality of something or not, but tradition does not mean wrong in the entire. The Constitution agrees that we are constituents, that we have peculiarities. And when crime is committed in a particular area, and that's why it allows for customary courts, for example, for Sharia courts up to a certain level, that people can now appeal. So it's not, like I used to say, it's not, they are not exclusive. Even those uh, judgments that were passed in, within, uh, in the Sharia courts, they were appealed. Most of them were appealed. Uh, and to follow, so this constitution is here supreme, but it has feeders or things that feed into it. And so for us to ignore them entirely, this, when we took Boko Haram, and I'm aware that time we should be rounding up, when we took Boko Haram, it happened in the Northeast. Most of the victims are Muslims. Most of the perpetrators are Muslims. They are Muslim communities, and so on and so forth. And we are saying that instead of emphasizing that you must follow a particular way, look at a way like in, in, in Rwanda, I still go back to that. They evolved systems and say that we can use the Gachacha, which is a traditional system that we're used to that has legitimacy. Remember that people, people in some areas don't have faith. I mean, let's, let's face it, don't have faith in this formal system and so They believe it's expensive. It doesn't just go with the... So, so why don't we have something that have legitimacy that is consistent with the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and use that side by side with the formal court systems? All right. Thank you very much, Wing Commandant, retired Musa Salmanu. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, and um, we hope to have you another time.